Welcome to the Take 92 podcast. My name is Sammy Warmhands. I am your host. And today, I can't believe this actually happened. We're talking with Bill Stevenson from The Descendants, All Black Flag, Only Crime, and of course, The Blasting Room. If you've ever spent any amount of time with me in the studio or listening to punk rock music, you've heard me reference The Blasting Room and how important it is to me and how influential it's been. Now, DFS, my band, Dead Fucking Serious, we just released a new album that was mixed and mastered there by co-owner Jason Livermore. It was a dream come true. I've always wanted to work there. And then they announced their 25th anniversary show is coming up this fall. So I thought, what better time to sit down with Bill and talk about this amazing body of work. So here it is. 25 years of the blasting room with Bill Stevenson. Hello. Bill, how's it going? How are you doing? Good, man. Really excited to talk to you. Okay. I wanted to start by uh, saying that I, I appreciate you coming on the show. You were my first punk rock show 20 years ago. I, I had, really? Where was that show? Uh, I'm from Eugene, Oregon, and uh, I had just started my first band like a year before that, and I went to see Less Than Jake, All, Good Riddance, and Limp at the Wow Hall. Oh, right. Oh, so you, so you were at the wow, the wow Hall show in 98, that would have been. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I man. It was like uh, Hello Rock View and Operation Phoenix and Mass Nerder time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, at, at that point, I had only heard uh, Worlds on Heroin um, from that Punkarama but uh, yeah, man, that show really uh, blew my mind and, and kind of opened the gates to me. It was pretty cool. At that age, I was starting to get excited about music and, and read, you know, you're reading the liner notes, you're getting to know Jerry Finn and Andy Wallace and Ryan Green and these names that keep popping up. You know, before long, I started to see your name a lot, starting with that Operation Phoenix record. And it really became uh, uh, something that I would look for you know, in, in my early years all the way till now of like, uh, you guys came up with a sound that just really, uh, fascinated me early on. It really stood out at the blasting room. How's your telephone reception? I keep hearing, uh, fragments of what you say. I think I know everything you said, but I'm not positive. Well, it's sounding a little windy. A little windy? Yeah. Sounds like you're, uh, in a car or outside or something. I'll never tell. <laughs> okay. Well, can you hear me okay? I, well, I couldn't before. You sounded choppy. Oh, okay. Now you don't sound choppy, so we keep going, right? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I was digging back through some of your old interviews, and uh, I found one from uh, Mass Nerder era where you talked about hearing a bass part out of tune on the Beatles' Love Me Do. Yeah, Love Me Do, yeah. Yeah. I would notice things, you know, I was getting into bands for the first time and people go, oh, have you heard the Misfits? And they'd play the Misfits. I'd be like, oh, this sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you I, know. I, those guys are old friends of mine. I, I'm not going to comment on that. Oh, no. I, I mean, I love I love the music in time. But at first, like like with Bad Religion, the first thing I heard was 8085. And I was like, oh, I've been seeing this, this band's name around a lot. You know, I heard 8085. I'm like, oh, this is awful. <laughs> and then I heard All Ages, you know, and it starts with I Want to Conquer the World. I'm like, oh, this is great. Okay, now I get it, you know. And so, like, sound was always such a big thing for me that, like, hearing those uh, those blasting room sounds and those big round drums and uh, you know those bass lines that were filthy—they just cut through everything. Um, you know, that stuff really fascinated me. I just I wanted to lead by just talking about that sound that you and Stefan and Jason kind of came up with. I mean, how would you define the blasting room sound? Oh, I don't know if I can define it, but we could certainly talk about it, right? Yeah. You mentioned the drums, and that may be one of the interesting things about the Blasting Room. All three of us, meaning myself, Stephen Edgerton, and Jason Livermore, we're, we're all drummers. Uh, I mean, we're all quite good drummers. I don't mean that Stephen and Jason just piddle around on drums. I mean, they shred. They're great drummers. Yeah. Uh, and plus, plus... Me, uh, you know, having been a drummer my whole life. Uh, so, when, you know, when bands come into the studio, we always would joke and be like, well, you know, it's a, it's a tough audience for the drummer of the band because 
It's yeah. just, I don't feel that we put an, an overt emphasis on drums, but it, in some ways, it, at times, it seems like it's the first time just because we're all players. Yeah, I mean, it definitely stands out. I mean, you, you guys have a signature drum sound, I would say. I like to think that we make honest records. Yeah. Uh, they're not completely organic and like au natural with, you know, two bikes in a room and this kind of thing. But but they're not so they're not so processed that, that they that they don't ring true to the ear. And I, I feel like I feel like people are smarter than maybe some engineers give them credit for being. I think people can intuit uh, like falseness. Falseness can show its face in a lot of different ways, like real triggered sample drums that kind of sound like typewriters and, you know, just don't really have any heart in them or, uh, you know, vocals that have been tuned uh, too much. These these kinds of things. Uh, I, I just think we try to shy away from some of that so that it, it sounds believable. When you hear one of our records, you go, man, this is what this is what this band really sounds like on a kick-ass day in a real good sounding room. Yeah, and I think that's the key is you guys kind of ride the line between going after that perfect sound but then still keeping the energy of a performance, you know? I, I remember reading back in uh, the early 2000s, there was like a recording issue of Alternative Press and they had a little blurb with you in there about like, how do you guys get that drum sound? And you're like, use the thickest head you can find and crank the 150 hertz. And, you know, as like a high schooler, I was like, okay, on our next record. <laughs> well, now that sounds like you're talking about uh, like a, maybe a particular strain of our snare drums. Yeah, early on. I like a lot of the actual deep shell sound in the snare. Yeah. Uh, so I don't tune the snares too brightly, too high try not to let them get too papery, like too too pointed. I like them to have a a good shell resonance. So sometimes I'll, you know, enhance that shell resonance a little bit with narrow band, uh, low frequency EQ. Yeah, I mean, you guys have a, a drum kit that when you're playing it on a good system, it's like you can almost feel the resonance of the snares in, in the subs, kind of, you know, like they just have such a full, like a richness to them. That's always just fascinated me, no matter what band is coming through there. You know, I think to, to give some credit where credit to, uh, there are a few things come to mind when I think about us kind of formulating our idea of what makes a good drum sound. One of which is some of those Andy Wallace mixes. Yeah. For instance, the Rage Against the Machine album, it's just, the drums are just, uh, they're so physical sounding. They really just sound like somebody's, you know, just beating the hell out of something with a baseball bat. Yeah. Particularly that first Rage Against the Machine record. And then other things, other things too, like say, um, some of Trombino's productions, I, no one record is coming to mind. Well, maybe like that, that No Knife album, uh, I I don't know which which no knife album it is, but it just sounds so so believable and natural. We really have been attracted to things that are believable and natural, but knowing that they're not knowing that they're not completely organic. That you know they have been manipulated, they have been EQ'd, et cetera, compressed, but you know not done so in a in an amateurish way. Yeah, Trombino had one of my favorite pop punk mixes in the the Living End. A modern artillery album uh, I thought was just a f fantastic representation of that band and you know there is a lot of layering and, and a lot of other shit going on but um, it really just brought those songs to life in a, in a way that not a lot of their other records did his best stuff to me is, is like some of the best stuff ever when he's on man he's on you talk about that Rage album that's it, that was done at Sound City wasn't it you mean the mixing um, well, I want to say that it was uh, it was tracked there because I I think they talked about it in that uh, that movie. Um, but I mean, you guys also did a, a the Descendants record mixed by Andy Wallace. I mean, what was that experience like? Did you take stuff from that session back with you? We did. The interesting thing about everything sucks though is that 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 mix 
really isn't completely representative of of the stuff that I really like from Wallace. Yeah, I think it sounds different than both of your guys' normal work. Yeah, well, he he chose to kind of make us make it real mid forward, so real aggressive sounding, like you know, lots of middle mids in the guitars and lots of like yelly yelly tones in the vocals. You know, uh, you know, not so it's not a very hi fi sounding thing. Yeah, if we were gonna like circle back and compare it to to Rage Against the Machine or something, or even to compare it to to Milo Goes to College. Like, Milo Goes to College, in its own right, it has a kind of a hi-fi sound to it. It's like crystal clear. Yeah. And crystal clear with deep deep bass, but audible bass. Uh, the guitars are kind of small on it, though, to make room for, like, the bass, you know, playing so much melody and so forth. But um, Wallace's... Wallace's mix on Everything Sucks, it's way more just mid-forward, just like, ah, ah. And I think it's cool. It kinda, he kind of made us sound tough. So, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little bit closer to his, like, Out Come the Wolves mix than, like, it, it's like maybe a little bit of a raw I version that of that. What it is, is he's smart enough to know that those kinds of bands, punk bands, they need, you can't suck all the mid out of it and make it all high fi and pro-sounding, or you kind of, you kind of, um, you know, castrated a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, the story goes that the studio was funded with your advance from Pummel. Is that is that right? Yes, we were signing a record deal with Interscope, and we thought, well, do we want to keep renting studio time, or why don't we just build our own studio and then we can just record whenever we want for free? So that's what we did. And it was only sort of as an afterthought that it became a, uh, you know, its own entity as far as its own business unto itself. We, it was weird. No sooner, we didn't even have paint on the walls yet. Like, we had just gotten the drywall up, and bands started calling me, wanting to come record. And we were just like, well, hell, we haven't even built it yet. And so, but yeah, so we started recording bands right away without ever, say, you know, advertising or or trying to promote it or whatever, and then it just then it just took on a life of its own. So, who was the first band you did after all? Um, I remember the first two. I don't remember which one was for either Hagfish or Alligator Gun. Alligator Gun is not a known thing, but I think some people know Hagfish. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think a lot of people know Hagfish. What am I saying? Actually, I only know Hagfish because of Only Crime. <laughs> Oh, weird, because that, man, yeah, because that Hackfish album we did is, that's a, to me, that's classic Blasting Room sound, kind of. Yeah. It's, but it's it's more classic pre-Jason Blasting Room sound, so it's very mid-forward, very well, mid-forward, very, um, um, kind of like what we were talking about with Everything Sucks. Well, I was going to ask about that, because obviously you and Stefan had history. Where, where did you meet Jason? Uh, Jason... We met him when we were on tour, on, on an all tour, and we kind of, um, after the show, we, you know, kind of drank beers and hung out, and I believe that we we crashed at his house where there were a bunch of people living at a house, but with us, we wouldn't really crash at the house so much as park our truck outside the house and run an extension cord so that the air conditioners would work, and we'd usually just sleep <laughs> in the truck, but so we'd kind of party kind of party at the house and hang out but then when it's time to go to sleep we usually just go sleep in our bunks and how did he get folded into the blasting room oh, oh right i'm sorry so that's how we met him and so then when he found out through a mutual friend that we were building a studio he he wrote us a letter asking um asking if we needed any help uh, you know sort of an internship or he'd come and help out and because he wants to learn how to be a recording engineer and this kind of thing. And so we, he kind of, he, he kind of just showed up with his backpack and kind of camped out on the couch there in the Studio A control room. And uh, we, I think he just absorbed everything that Stefan and I had to, to offer. I mean, we didn't really teach him. He just absorbed it. He observed, he observed it and, and took note of it. And he 
you know, the next thing we knew, he was a far better engineer than either one of us were. <laughs> if that, if that happened. That I mean, that was a real pleasure to see that. It took, I don't know, I, you know, over what, however many years that was, but th- but that was really cool. So he kind of just came in and and made a place for himself, and and it it's kind of been that way with all the blasting room uh, staff. They've kind of come in, and it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll make the coffee, I'll clean the bathroom, but in six months' time, I'm going to be doing my own sessions. I mean, they didn't <laughs> yeah. say this out loud, but that's what they were thinking. And that's how it's that's how it's kind of worked out. People have kind of showed showed themselves as being awesome, and then next thing you know, there's there's work for them. So you've got Andrew Berlin and Chris Beeble. Is there anybody else there? And Jonathan Jonathan Luganville, he's my newest one. Okay, I think he's been there for five years now, but he pretty much single handedly has built us two new studios. So now we have four studios. Damn. Yeah. So I just I joke about it. I say I only I only hire geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see. Last night I uh, I decided to to bone up for this by watching the Filmage movie again. I was struck by the scene where um, they're talking about doing a vocal session for all, and you. Uh, had taped the Snickers bar up to the glass, like when you finish, you get this. And uh, it cracked me up because when I first started uh, uh, my home studio here, I recorded a lot of bands when I started in 2005. And the first band that I ever did, uh, we were really good friends and I was fucking with the singer. I was like, you do this. And I had taped a Twinkie up there and there's even a photo of the dude singing into a twinkie in the in the shock mount for the mic and so <laughs> i cracked up when i heard the snicker story i'm like oh yeah i've been there <laughs> well this is you know this is funny but my memory isn't so good with respect to who that would have been that wanted that snicker bar because the only person that really wants a snicker bar that badly is me because <laughs> uh, I, I mean dave nolte dave nolte used to bribed me with with candy bars when we were going to play Descendants shows. Yeah. He'd give me a whole, when I was a kid, I mean, he'd give me a whole bag of candy bars because he knew I would eat them and get all hyped up and then we would play a good show. I had Russ Rankin on here recently and we talked about when uh, they went to work with you on Op Phoenix and you flew out to watch a couple of their practices and he said, he remembers uh, playing the songs and like looking over and you're looking right over his shoulder, just frantically writing on a notepad. And he's like, what are you doing? And he said that you told him you were writing a roadmap of their songs. What do you remember about hooking up with Good Riddance? And, and I mean, you guys have made a ton of records together now, but I mean, how did that bond get started? I'm, I'm, I'm curious because you guys have made some classics together. At a certain point in the late 90s, it seemed like sentiment in the Fat Records camp was that several of the bands were maybe trying to maybe just step away from, let's just call it the kind of fat epitaph sound at the time. Uh-huh. That there, you know, a lot of those records had some pretty obvious telltale signs of, you know, the way they were engineered and that sort of thing. And maybe, so some of the bands maybe wanted to, you know, step away from that and try something different. So then, you know, we had, so we had Lag Wagon and we had Good Riddance and we had uh, Less Than Jake, uh, you know, coming our way later on, uh, you know, no use for a name. And yeah, so we, we, um, we started doing records for Fat and you know, we kind of started doing more and more of them and we eventually ended up being the, you know, producers and mixers for No Effects as well and, and all that. And it just, uh, I don't know, I guess it was, it was uh, maybe time for some of those bands to just try something something different than what they had been doing. And we got along so well with Good Riddance. Good Riddance is, you know, they're like family to all of us. We're very close with them. We've had a long, long-running relationship. I guess it's been 21 years now. Yeah, I mean, not only the records, but, you know, the tours and the collaborations. I mean, in terms of... Uh, you know, the punk rock I know and love, I mean, 
these are, are staples of my record collection. I mean, I remember talking to Russ about symptoms and he said that really being a high mark in where everyone was was kind of firing on all cylinders. Uh, what, what do you remember about making symptoms of a leveling spirit? Symptoms has got a real good majority of, of great songs on it. I think that we, the Blasting Room, I think that we did not mix that album as well as it should have been mixed. Interesting. But, um, but other than that one misgiving i think it's very strong and it's got very strong material on it i think it's a very good riddance is a band where where i like a couple of their newer records quite a bit better than than a lot of the earlier ones we did for them like this very newest one we did for them i i just love it i can't believe how many good how many great songs they wrote it's it's so cool yeah the last two are fucking great uh, but yeah symptoms is uh it is a little bit of a different sound for you guys it's a kind of a guitar heavy mix for you guys I mean, that's the way I hear it. It's like... Well, well, and that may be part of what... I mean, it does not quite have the drum power that we're known for. You know, if one thing's louder, it means something else is quieter. Yeah. Of, so we're kind of... We're, I think we may be saying the same thing. Yeah. In the early years, the the high point of me and my bandmates, you know, in high school going, holy shit, this sound, what are these guys doing, was Revolutions Per Minute with Rise Against. Because we were big fans of the unraveling, and then when that second record dropped, we're like, "Oh my god!" Like from the songwriting, the production, everything about that was majorly influential. They were another band that kind of, even though they were on Fat, they they weren't using the um, yeah, they weren't using the Ryan Green uh, Motor Studios combination, and we we just hit it off with them so well. We are we are so close to them. Even now, we're—I mean, we're closer now. That some of the more rewarding friendships of my life, you know, came came out of that revolutions per minute recording. What is that like watching a band grow from? You're working with them on their first fat project, which I'm sure they're very excited about, and then you're just seeing this trajectory. You know, they made Siren Song elsewhere, but for the most part, well, and and uh, Wolves, I think. Um, but for the most part, I mean, all those records have been with you, and you're just watching them get bigger and bigger. I mean, what has that experience been like in your, your relationship with them? Well, we grew together. Their band grew, and our studio grew. So it was just, we just, yeah, we, we, we grew up together. It's been fun. But it's been crazy, because, I mean, with, with them, we had some, you know, we have had some huge, huge hit songs and that kind of thing, which obviously none of us ever expected to ever be part of any of that. Like when we, when I started my band or whatever, when we built the studio, I never thought I would ever participate in that level of, of, um, I guess really it's not about fame or whatever, but it's about how widely known something is that you do. You know, the fact that, wow, like tons and tons and tons of people dig this, that, that is, that's so cool. That's, it's, it's, it's gratifying. It makes you feel good about drinking your coffee and going and sitting behind the desk all day. Yeah. I mean, this is the shit I was listening to in high school, but nowadays, Rise Against is so household. They're my mom's favorite band. <laughs> like, no joke. Yeah, that's funny. She took it's the whole family to I'm go out see them. Uh, be like, aren't you the dude from the Descendants? Yeah, my, yeah, my dad's really into you guys. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, man. And some of those... But the worst one is like... Hey, didn't you used to be Bill Stevenson? Like, that's the, <laughs> that's the best. Uh, like, I still am. Last time I checked, I mean, my son, my son, my son still thinks I'm <laughs> But uh, in that body of work with Rise Against, uh, I mean, what is it like? We talked a little bit about Andy Wallace. I mean, you had a record like Suffer and the Witness where um, I remember at the time really excited, oh, they're back at the blasting room, and then I buy it, and I look at the back cover, I'm like, Oh, weird. This was mixed by Chris Lord Algae. What, what are those experiences like in taking your project and giving it to you know the, the label to find a mixer for or something like that? Sometimes when you've been working on something for several weeks or even even you know a couple couple or a few months, it can provide a lot of relief to sort of hand it over to someone who, who you trust and who is accomplished in their field and who has a, a sound that you that you can respect 
and get behind. Yeah. You know, turn it over to them and let them do their thing. And then maybe you just, um, you know, you just make a few comments about whatever certain details that maybe they, they overlooked, maybe things that, that you'd prefer to be a little different. And so sometimes that can be a great, a great thing where you're, you you know you know and you you know in your heart that it's better than you could have done because you just were much too familiar with the project to really be able to have the necessary fresh perspective to to come up with you know a, a very righteous mix. But then other times when you when you hire a mixer and it's not going well and you just you know you are oh, you know just it's good over get out of the way let me do it. you know but but, but you can't do that. So it's, it's just, I guess it's the old thing of, you know, you find, you, you hire people you trust and then you let them do their job, uh, but without a, without a lot of armchair quarterbacking. But sometimes, sometimes you have to collaborate with them. Wallace, Wallace is always, he's always very good about the, the push and pull. You know, he wants to know all the band's comments and the producer's comments. And he wants to know what everybody thinks and he he actually said he needs he needs that struggle. He needs that push and pull to really find a great mix for the band that everyone's that everyone's happy with. It's kind of kind of some of those some of those little minor details. The the mixer he just might overlook it because they're, they're details that are more they're more unique to the identity of that particular band. Yeah, and so it takes that particular band or one of one of their representatives to point those things out and go, Hey, what about this? Hey, what about this? And I always wonder that because, you know, like we, we just made this record for Dead Fucking Serious here and, you know, Jason mixed, mixed it and mastered it. And, you know, he was great with any time I had feedback, killed it, did exactly what we needed. But, you know, I never know how that works in the big label world of like, are you still getting input as a producer after the fact or not? You know? Yeah. Yeah. We, we usually are. Um, sometimes you find yourself dealing with egos and then you know you maybe have to I don't know you have to choose your words about how tactfully you make a suggestion I find some of the most famous people out there have the most fragile egos yeah uh, and so sometimes that can be a, that can be a challenge but really if you know how to if you know how to communicate if you know how to how to represent your thoughts then that's that's usually not a big deal either yeah uh, so I wanted to talk about my good friend's Broadway Calls. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we go way back from when they were in uh, Hardcore as Countdown to Life. When they started Broadway Calls, we thought, oh, this is a cool little side project, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it th that first record drop, we're like, holy shit. And, you know, next thing we know, they're making the second LP with you guys. And, uh, you know, we, we've just been... Uh, always in their corner, so happy for them. And I, I had them on the show recently, and they were talking about those early records with you. Uh, wh what do you remember about hooking up with Broadway Calls? That was just a special bond for me. We did, the, the four of us, we just hit it off so well. And I felt like I was, I don't know, I felt like I was in their band. I really, really got involved with every little iota of the arrangements, what was being played, and all the little drum fills and things. For some reason, they just sucked me in in a way that, that I loved the songs enough to where it just made me want to really make it special, make it pretty. And yeah, so we just worked, we just worked like hell together. Man, I love that. You know that song, Midnight Hour? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and also the the one about the election, uh, um, I, I can't think of the title right now, but on that same record, oh man, yeah, I love them. And Josh is such a great drummer, uh, but on, on that second one you guys did, Comfort Distraction, I remember the performances that Ty was giving on that record blew me away. I mean, the, the hooks and just him belting out some of those melodies was oh man i i i live for that kind of shit man it was so good he and, he and i he, really all those guys i mean we love hanging out I, I, ty and i we hang out any any chance we can it's just it's just all good good feeling with them there's a few few bands like that that are even though really hardly anyone's heard of them or or even if they have i mean they're not famous bands but there's a few bands like that that just have such a 
such a special place in, in my in my heart. Another one is the band Audio Karate. Mm. Oh man, I love that Lady Melody album. Oh, that song Jesus is Alive and Well and Living in Mexico. That I think that might be my all time favorite thing I've ever been involved with recording. Uh, as far as not as a player, but as a, as a producer, you know. Yeah. It's either got to be that, or it's got to be that propaganda song on supporting cast called "It's Called Without Love." Those are those are my oh man, I get goosebumps when I hear those. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about propaganda as well. Like Potemkin was was the first thing I heard from them that really like blew my fucking mind. Like the way that they were just so integrating you know, skate punk and thrash metal on that record. And the lyrics are so urgent and poignant. And, um, and then following it with, because I know you guys just mixed that one, but then following it with supporting cast was like, holy shit. I mean, those guys were unstoppable at that time. Yeah. We really, really have a close bond with them. We, the last few records, they've kind of been doing them themselves up in Canada with local engineers. Yeah. I'm not, quite positive who they're working with or what it is but they they've been sending them you know to us to mix and master so that's been good for them i mean i think you know it's hard when you're you come down to fort collins and sleep on some bunk beds for a month i mean so they yeah they, they do a good job recording and then we mix it but supporting cast we did both you know we we produced it and mixed it but and mastered it yeah i mean i think that's that's a real standout in both of your catalogs to me I agree. When we were working on the, the mixes for this DFS record, when I got the first mix back from Jason, my note was, think less Potemkin City Limits and more supporting cast. <laughs> and he, when oh, he, well, I would say that always. Yeah, yeah. that's like my life motto, but yeah. Well, yeah, and when, when we turned it around, and it, it had gone from this, like, because I have a very small room, and so, you know, it was kind of compensating for that in making kind of a... a a bigger, roomier sounding mix. And uh, then on the second one, it was this really tight, punchy fucking, I was like, yes, that's exactly what I'm after. But I like being able to just draw on the past blasting room work and go, oh, well, think about this record, think about that record. And he knew exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, Jason, he's got such a high aptitude. Well, you know, like I said, I only, I only work with geniuses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's Jason, the best. Jason, he's a, He's the co-owner of the studio with me. Yeah, and he's, I mean, I, I told you when we were setting this up, I was like, I have wanted a Jason Livermore mix. Because uh, you guys have done some mastering for me before, but I was like, I've wanted a Jason Livermore mix since fucking high school. Now, another pair of records that's kind of like that to me is uh, the first two you did with No Effects. There was a day in, in 2006, the same day, Wolves and Wolves Clothing came out and uh, Sick of It All record, uh, Death to Tyrants. And those two records coming out on the same day was like so inspiring that I started my current band like a week later. I mean, it was just like, I, I couldn't believe how experimental and inspired that Wolves record was. You know, that being their, their first with you guys. Well, actually, and you went out to uh, Motor Studios to do that record, right? With no effects, I usually, yeah, I go out there because he owns his own studio so i go out there and their their studio is fine it's kind of a kind of a smaller version of of our studio a so it's like smaller than our studio a but bigger than our studio b and they have an ssl and i'm familiar with most of the gear so it works out and i bring i bring some gear to you know a few things that that i might need and that saves them money. Yeah. You know, they can just do it there where they live. And it works out, and then I bring it home. I bring it home, and Jason mixes it. That had, I think, the widest variety of, like, different guitar tones on one record than I've probably ever heard out of uh, your work before. It's funny, because you just gave me a flashback to this big pile of notes I had of... <laughs> I guess I had about a half a dozen guitar amps set up in the control room and, you know, maybe as many cabinets in the live room and two or three bass amps. And so it's quite a big to-do, you know, for a punk record. I had all this stuff set up and 
And I, we would be bouncing around from this amp to that amp, or this cabinet to that cabinet, or let's only use the 421s on this cabinet for this song, but then we're going to use these M160s more on the other song, or use the Marshall on this song, or the Mesa on the other, or we're going to blend the blend the Fender Bassman, and you know, just really, really bouncing around. And I just I had to keep track of it all was the worst part. That was long enough ago to where I guess I either wasn't smart enough or it just hadn't quite become common practice to take pictures oh, of the amps. Yeah. And plus pictures, unless you do them right, sometimes they don't give you an exact thing. Yeah. Because you have to actually center the photo on each knob, in my opinion. Like, you can't just take a picture of the amp. You have to center the lens right over each knob to get each knob perfect. But so, so yeah, I was just digging through all these notes and and figuring it all out. And it, I think it came out cool just because, we, yeah, we were jumping around a lot. But then there were certain staples. We were using a Jazzmaster guitar a lot and the, uh, and the SG a lot. A lot of the... Uh, Dan Electro bass, but then also some of the precision bass too. Well, and I think that, you know, for whatever melodic experimentation was happening, I mean, the rhythm section in that band is so consistent that that was kind of the glue for it, you know? Yeah, it was just one drum setup. So it wasn't like, oh, let's change snares on the chorus and, ch you know, then go back to the other snare. On the ver there wasn't much of that. It was like one drum setup for the whole thing. And then it was more like, Okay, well, on this song, we'll, we'll lean on the room mics harder. And on um, these other songs, we, we won't lean on the room mics as hard. Yeah. And I think that, like, when you guys follow that with Coaster, that that is a, a much more indicative of, like, a cornerstone blasting room mix. I'll tell you the difference. Wolves, we mixed it at Motor. Oh. And so we, weren't, we didn't have our home court advantage. I didn't realize that. Yeah, whereas Coaster, we mixed it at Blasting. Was that due to you being dissatisfied with Wolves in a way? No, I mean, we Wolves at Blasting too, but Fatty wanted us to do it at uh, Motor, so we did. Yeah. It's fine with everything, but I don't know. Sometimes it's really hard to get the, the subtleties of the low-end frequencies right unless you're in your own... Room. Yeah, it's true, because, I mean, the the monitoring accounts for a lot. Yeah. I think they both sound equally good in different ways, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not like, pleased with one and displeased with the other. Well, that's good. I mean, I, I, I think uh, you guys were cranking out so many great records in that in that era, like uh, the, the last No Use album was also one of my favorites that you guys have done. I mean... Sonically, songwriting. I mean, the for for that to end up being where they left off, uh, I think is really going out on a high note. I loved doing that with them. We we hit it off so well, and we really had fun. Matt and I just had a great grand old time doing the bass, and and Tony and I, we we yeah, we did so much singing and so so much trying things. And he, the one thing that was so great about him is that. Considering how accomplished he already was at the time, and also how, I, I mean, for want of a better term, how famous their band was already and everything, how established, Tony was very willing to take direction from me, uh, which which just made, uh, which, it, I mean, it, it helped to make things better. He wasn't, his ego wasn't in the way. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not saying he doesn't deserve an ego. He certainly does. But I mean, it's good when a it's good when an accomplished person is smart enough to to actually you know listen to those around them. Well, yeah, it's a true collaboration in that way. Yeah, it's great. It was just it was so it was so great, so great doing that record. And again, I think uh, his vocal performances are his best ever on that album. I mean, it, it... that's what I think, and I think it's a big part of it is what I was just talking about. That's what I think. I think he sounds fuller, fuller, and just more confident, bigger, 
bigger. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how to say it. Yeah. I mean, I think that there was such a huge leap on the More Betterness album in terms of his his singing and his melodies and Hard Rock Bottom following that. I think those were really, really huge growth period uh, in his songwriting and performances. But it completely shied away from the kind of grit of the earlier records. And then this last one really married the two, I thought, that it brought a little bit of the edge back to it and didn't lose any of the pop. That's a, I feel like that's a very good assessment. Yeah, it just sounded like a, a well-rounded, like a, a very complete No Use for a Name album. Not a one, it wasn't one-sided in any way. I love so many songs on that. I love Yours to Destroy. Yeah. And I love The Biggest Lie. And they were so they were nice enough to let me sing on that one. I'm singing with Matt, you know, the answer, the little answer vocals. Oh, really? And the chorus, you know how every other line is, it's Tony and then it's like the backing vocals. Oh, man. I'm going to have to listen to I, that. They were generous enough to let me sing because I kept, I kept singing along, you know, and they're like, hey, Bill, why don't you do this one with Matt? So I, I got to sing with, with Matt on the, the Biggest Lie. That's awesome. And then, uh, oh, yeah, Yours to Destroy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some, great, some, some great classic, stuff. classic cuts on that record. And what's the one, what's my favorite one that I can't think of it right now? You can keep talking. I'm going to look it up. Okay. I, so a lot of times, the, a lot of times, like with all the bands we work with, a lot of times I only know their songs by the working title. Yeah. But cause rarely is the final title the same title as what, you were calling it when you were working on it. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, even with Rise Against, so many of their songs, I only know the... The, uh, the demo versions? The working titles, yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we get through the uh, to the end here, oh, I want... Dregs of Sobriety. Dregs of Sobriety? I don't recognize that title either. I'm so used to listening to it front to back, I don't always look at the titles. <laughs> Oh, let's see. I want to be wrong. It's so good. You're so oh, destroy. Yeah. See, his his titles are, are easier because he says the he says the uh, the title in the chorus a lot. <laughs> and then one of the songs, uh, Tony let Stacy, my wife, sing on it with him. Oh wow! I'm, oh, that song, Ontario. Oh yeah, yeah. Because there is a female voice in that song. That's yeah, that's my wife. <laughs> that's awesome. I just played a show at a uh, uh, Gilman Street last week, and uh, uh, Cinderblock was in one of the bands. I was like, shit, I know you from. I couldn't even think of what No Use record. I was like, I know you from one of those No Use songs, like one of the duet songs that he's done. Um, well, you know her from Tilt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where you know her from. Yeah. Yeah, um, she's great. So. I, I couldn't talk about the blasting room without talking about a certain band and I'll <laughs> my introduction to them was I went to see Portland and Eugene back to back shows of Strung Out and Only Crime and this other band I had never heard of. When I got there, my friends had gone to the Seattle show as well. They said, You're gonna love this first band. Uh they sound like my band had gone into some weird experimental hardcore direction they're like what was it wilhelm yeah they're like it's they sound like what you guys would have done if you kept playing punk rock and i heard that shit and i was so blown away and then i went home and i researched them online i was like oh nitro records oh blasting room holy shit and so i went to the eugene show the next day and uh i i bought mute print and i was forever in love with that band and 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 the ability to in songwriting, in performance, and in production, every single record topped themselves. I, I feel like Wilhelm is just the best fucking band in punk rock, man. They're they're one of my all time favorite bands. Uh, but my my favorite of theirs is Mute Print because the songwriting is just so insanely strong on it. Mm. Uh, it it's not the best sounding one. We did it sort of quite quickly. They didn't have a label or anything. We did it quite quickly. Yeah. But but that's got so many great songs on it. And then Ruiner is my second favorite. That still has so many, many great songs, but it also sound, sounds 
Now the new, their newest one, they recorded it themselves. They have their own little studio now, and they're doing a good job recording. And Andrew, so Andrew mixed it at Blasting, and I love that one. I love that song, Boat Builders. Oh, yeah, man. that album is yeah, fucking that's a incredible. Great song, holy. And and to me, perhaps my favorite sounding record in the Blasting Room canon is Career Suicide. That's your favorite sounding one. It's it's just a fucking monster record. Um, like if I'm listening to a mix on somebody else's stereo or something for reference, I'll put on Career Suicide so I know what it's supposed to sound like. <laughs> like I've played that album to death. I mean, I played all of them. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, on that on Career Suicide, I like um, Die While We're Young. Yeah, and uh, we built the city on debts and booze. Those are my. My two favorite. Oh, and get mad, you son of a bitch. Yeah, the lyrics on that album are great. Well, that one's sad. That's a, well, it's about John, you know, their bass player who left to, you know, to kind of get a real job and everything. Yeah, they're all. I mean, they're all still very close friends now. But when he left, Trevor was so heartbroken, you know, that he wrote that song. Speaking of Trevor, I've I've been talking to him a little bit, and he's been kind of showing me updates on the studio he's building. Um, I mean, how does it feel to you when? a band that you've worked with or maybe even mentored like, you know, Trevor goes off to build his own place or like Roger from Less Than Jake builds a moat house, you know, I mean, how, how does it feel watching these bands you've worked with go on and start their own shit? Yeah, it's great. It's, it's, I get a, I get a good feeling from it. Um, yeah, Roger, he makes solid records. And every once in a while he sends some of them our way to mix them. Yeah. I thought yeah, See the Light was extraordinary. He, yeah. Roger does great work and, Trevor, he's one of the gnarliest musicians and songwriters I've ever met. So his talent is, is limitless. It's it's great that he's you know interested in all that and doing doing well with it. Yeah. All right. Well, a couple things before I wrap up here. I wanted to talk about you guys have a blasting room sample pack out there. We do. Oh, sample pack. Yeah. Like a drum a drum sound program. Yeah. Yes, we do. I thought you meant like a a sample pack, you know, yeah, you get um Oh like a compilation? Like like an hors d'oeuvre or something or like you know, a T shirt and a C D <laughs> or some shit. I didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, we have our drum library, yeah, our drum our drum thing with that with that crazy good uh MIDI interface that I I, I have to still learn how to use because i don't really know much about midi yeah but but my guys do my younger guys do this so they can set me up they set me up yeah it's got that the snare the one snare like, i don't know if, what they're calling it in there but it's the tama art star snare and when you hit it, it it sounds exactly like coolidge you know the recorded version of coolidge oh, shit. that snare in the beginning yeah. yeah it's i mean it's the exact sound it's so funny and there's all kinds of other stuff we had those those mahogany those mahogany toms really sound nice. They spent hours and hours and hours tuning our drums, and it was it was all, uh, yeah, all very meticulous. And so my read on it is that it was mostly for like like you said MIDI and programming drums and stuff like that. It's not necessarily for like mixing samples like other. Well, you know, no, it can be. You can lay those things in there. You know, you can blend them. You can you can replace. Uh, yeah, like if let's say let's say let's say one of the guys gets a one of my guys gets a a real rough sounding recording, you know, something that's like you know demo quality. Yeah. Or the drummer is just really inconsistent with his tone and his volume, how he strikes the drums and all that. You can really go in there and actually actually make it sound like something. Yeah, I mean, cool. On on a minor level, I'll use bits of like drumagog that you know you could take those sampled sounds and you know, they're already a bit more compressed. They're going to sit in there better. You know, you're not going to get a ton of bleed when you throw a compressor on there or something. Um, you know, so I, I, I like using small bits of that in case of a fix, you know, if you're needing to get a little more presence out of it without, you know, getting yeah, that high hat. if it's a really, really crappy drummer, then you use big, big bits of it, large bits of <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So but I, obviously our our goal isn't to make artificial sounding records. So e even with the MIDI drums, okay, there's a way to do that and have it 
feel good and human, and there's a way to do that where you just ruin your record. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, is, is owned and operated still a thing? I kind of shut it down. Um, right, okay, so I was deathly ill for about two years. Yeah. A year and a half. And when I, after I came out of my brain surgery and everything, and I kind of resurfaced, and I go, okay, great. What, what kind of a mess have I made of my life here? Let's start putting the pieces back together. And one of the first things is like, well, okay, I got this label, but I don't really devote enough time to it for it to really be a thing it's really just kind of a catalog label well why don't i just give give the bands all back their records i mean literally send them all their records and just be done with it and let them sell the records on tour or let them find another label or whatever yeah so that was that was kind of one of the first things i did when i got uh when i wasn't sick anymore that's cool i just didn't i realized it wasn't something that i was going to devote the necessary time to with you know, with my various entrepreneurial endeavors, if I can use that term, <laughs> I, I've been pretty reasonable success. But it's been with the tons of you know, let's say the sweat of the brow, much effort, much much labor, nineteen hour days, seven days a week. But Damn. as I've gotten older, you know, I can't I can't do nineteen hour days, seven days a week. So it's, as part of it's been for me is, is admitting what stuff I I want to devote time to and what stuff I don't want to devote time to and also once I got better after the brain surgery I wanted to I wanted to be behind my drum set and playing shows and practicing and playing shows and writing songs and recording and so so that that just meant okay well okay what are you going to do Bill okay well you're going to play drums write songs and produce five six records per year for bands and that's that's what you're going to do you're not going to try to be every thing Every you know everything to every person. That's not that's not that's too much for you. Yeah, it makes sense. And I yeah, and I got so I got rid of the um, the, we had a T-shirt printing shop too as well. Oh wow. Yeah, we had the label, the studio, the band, and the T-shirt printing shop. And I got rid of the T-shirt printing shop too. I uh, just well, I'm, I'm gonna cut this out. I don't. I this is just something I don't really have time for. I thought I thought I did, but I don't. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to get spread too thin if you, if, if, because you, I mean, at the end of the day, you're putting your name on all of these things and you want them to be of a certain quality. And, and if you can't commit to, uh, developing them in that way, then, um, you know, it makes sense. You know, f- focus on, uh, f- focus on the most important ones or the most satisfying ones. So I remember, um, there was a, a line that Fat Mike said in Filmage that uh, there's not one person on earth who would pick all over the descendants. And in terms of uh, your personal body of work, the one that most sticks with me, and I don't know, maybe no one else feels this way, but is problematic. The, like the lyrics on that record, just the, the songwriting, I mean, like real people and, you know, what went wrong and s- stupid kind of love. And I mean... And and even like the angrier Carl songs, like "What Are You For" and "Crucifixion" and stuff like that. I mean, there's just something so so genuine in those lyrics. I don't know, man. I just uh, I couldn't speak to you and not share my appreciation for Problematic because I still listen to it all the time. Well, that's cool that you like that record. I think what that record represents to me, I think, is that is the four of us at the absolute pinnacle of our physical playing ability. Yeah. I mean, that, that was all done to tape. No no punching in, no overdubs, no editing, no Pro Tools, no screwing around. Uh, you know, that we overdubbed, yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm saying it wasn't, it was pre-Pro Tools, it wasn't like put together. I mean, we just, we were just really able to play smoothly and quickly in a way that, that we had been, like we had been heading up to that point for years and years and then that i think that that's the recorded that's the recorded apex of it i think i I think we even took some of the tempos of the song up a little too high i always thought that carry you with me should have been just a tiny bit slower Mm. uh certain things um but yeah but i i liked what we were doing then and i mean as far as trying to compare descendants to all i can't really do that i could compare Say this song to that song. I sure, can compare yeah. the song. I can compare this 
song Greedy to the song She's My Ex to the song Clean Sheets or Silly Girl. I could do that, but it, to me, it's the sentence and all is just kind of all part of our life. It's, it, you know, Carl and Stefan and I have been 36 years now, or 35, or whatever. Yeah. And it's just, it's all part of our journey. It, yeah. If people, I know that if you go to Japan, they'll give you a different answer than chat mic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, it, in Japan, this all, all, all quite, quite massive, and, you know, descendants are less big. It's funny because you make the jokes about big in Japan, but it, I mean, it's, I'm saying it's always been that way. It's not, not like a thing of uh, washed up bands or something. It, it, there's just, I guess, certain people in Europe too. All, all always did very, very well in Europe. Um, I guess, I guess it's, it's hard to, to compare the two or to judge the two or to, to try to talk about which is better or worse. I just think there's no, there's, that's just a waste of time. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I love it all. I just, that, that album isn't one that people necessarily bring up a lot. And so I, I just wanted to, uh, tell you that it meant something to me. And then I also remember reading, on your guys old website like years and years and years ago that there was a follow-up album being written did that ever get anywhere oh uh, that's the last stuff we did we did some demos of some we were trying to do an instrumental record uh, what, what that would be a lot of improvised stuff yeah but uh, we, we never quite managed to get happy with that so, but no, there's not like a hidden all album sitting somewhere, no. Okay, okay. Um, is there anybody, after all these years, that you haven't got to work with yet that you wanted to? Oh, man. These are the questions whenever you have to, yeah. <laughs> I wish I had been able to record the band Snapcase. Yeah. Because I thought, I just think, it's not like where your ego, oh, you know, I want to record that band, they're really kick-ass, and they're, you know, they're famous, or, or, no, but I just, when I heard them, I thought, man, I bet you, I bet you I could get a good sound on them, I bet you that would be, that would be a good thing. Yeah, like we could come up with some cool shit together. Yeah, 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 I, I always wanted to record Snapcase. Most of the bands that I want to record, I, uh, I, I have recorded, I, like, yeah. I can't think of any. You know the band that I would like to see work with you someday? I'm watching the movie last night, and fucking Dave Grohl is singing your praises through the whole thing, and I was like, why don't they make a Foo Fighters record there? I would love to see that, or bring you to Studio 606 or something. I was like, man, I w if he's that into Bill's work, I would love to see that collaboration. Oh, well, I mean, I I love Dave. You know, he and I go way back, and he, he we're still very friendly. He's, he's a good guy. He hasn't let his... um fame change him or anything he's still same old yeah. same old dave so that's good uh yeah it, it's great um i mean i would love to record them but uh, at the same time they're kind of so huge and i think they i don't know they they require a kind of huge i don't know i don't know if it, we would make a, a record that's too uh to strip down for them or something. I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, if you think about one of their early big records was, uh, he talks about it, they recorded it in a big fancy studio and they didn't like it and it sucked all the life out of it. And then they re-recorded the whole thing in his basement and that's what they released. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think, shit, they made one in his house a few years back with, uh, with Butch Vig. Like, I don't know. I, I could see it. I think he's got enough of the, the DIY uh, in him to to uh, to want to do some shit like that. I don't know. As okay, well, next time you talk to him, tell him he knows where to find me. <laughs> He's got my number. <laughs> yeah, just as a fan, I was like, oh, man, someday. Well, uh, before we wrap up, let's just talk real quick about the... Uh, you guys got the 25th anniversary uh, show yes, com com coming up this fall in Fort Collins. You've got All and the Descendants, Rise Against, Wilhelm Scream, just a, a amazing lineup here. Interestingly enough, Descendants have missed their 10th, 20th, 25th, 30th, 35th, <laughs> and 40th anniversaries, and never even never even looked back. We just it's just never been in our nature to to commemorate the past in a way. But 
But with the blasting room, you know, a couple of the guys suggested that we do a, a big blowout, a big celebration, just to just to sell, you know, just to let everybody know, hey, we've been doing this for 25 years, and check out all the cool shit we've done. When I started calling bands, I thought, well, I'm going to call for every four bands I call, three of them are going to say no because they're going to be busy or they're not going to want to come out. And we're, you know, we're doing it kind of as a non-profit thing, so they won't. We're not. We're not. Uh, we're just. It's just going to cover enough to cover all the flights and the hotels for the bands and everything. Yeah. I just thought a lot of bands were going to say no, but every single band I asked said yes. <laughs> so it was like, well, that was easy. Okay. And then we put it up for sale, and then it just sold out like in a week or something. And then I was like, well, okay, that was easy. Okay. Now, so now we're trying to plan other things. We're wanting to do a like kind of an open house at the studio, maybe the day of the show and or the day after. Oh so man. People could just people could come by and just kind of tour the studio, you know, as if it was a museum or something like that, but maybe not so lame. It's going to be fun. I mean, it's going to be fun to have all, all of that, all those people whom I admire so much all together like that. That's going to be great. That's fucking awesome, man. I'm, I'm really happy you guys are doing that. Will Hellman, Audio Karate, oh, come on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's just an amazing lineup. Propaganda couldn't make it. Oh, you got, you got one decline, huh? Yeah. Well, shit, man. I I think it's gonna be awesome. I I I wish I could make it all the way out there from Oregon, but uh, I'll be there in spirit. That's okay, dude. There'll be another one. Yeah, the next uh, twenty five years later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just joking. <laughs> I had I I stole that from Fatty. Actually, he I had to miss my son's high school graduation because of I had both a Descendants and a flag show at Punk Rock Bowling. And I, I hadn't even realized that I booked the shows on his graduation day. I didn't even know. And I was so, I, but I was up in motor recording, the, you know, with a new No Sex record that isn't out yet. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'm bummed. I'm gonna miss my son's high school graduation because of punk rock bowling. And Fatty goes, that's okay, dude. There'll be another one. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally funny, but also totally cruel. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I, I really appreciate your time. I am looking forward to that No Effects record. I, I could drone on for hours with you, but uh, uh, you I'm guys... tired of hearing myself talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, but uh, you know, you've been a huge influence on uh, my life and my band and my studio and everything. And uh, you know, it's it's a pleasure uh, learning more about you. Well, thank you for your time. It has been my pleasure. All right, that is our show. Huge thanks to Bill, and congrats to you and your whole crew on 25 years of this amazing catalog. I, I don't even know where to go from here. I mean, I, four years ago, I n- never would have expected that I'd be 60 episodes in and interviewing some of my absolute favorite artists in all of music. This has been a really great year for the show, whether you've been with me since day one or if you just recently got on board as I started doing more punk rock interviews. I I appreciate you guys checking it out and sharing it. Uh, If you haven't, go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. That also helps our visibility almost as much as sharing the stuff on your socials. I'm going to leave you with a new song, Mixed and Mastered, by Jason Livermore at The Blasting Room. This is my band, Dead Fucking Serious, recorded here at Take 92. And it's from our new album, Peril. It's called MAGA Man. <laughs>